Okay, welcome to today's uh, integrative research seminar. It is my pleasure to, to introduce Ruben Moreno, who will be uh, our speaker today. Um, Ruben has a degree in physics and a PhD also in physics from the Universitat Autonoma de Madrid. Yes. Um, and then he spent several years in New York City, so working at NYU and also in Rochester University until 2010 when he was awarded a Ramon y Cajal Fellowship and came back to Spain and he was working in the hospital San Juan de Deu, which is one of the leading pediatric hospitals in Europe and a very active uh, research institution. Since very recently, since 2015, um, he's part of our university and he created a new group in 2015 called the Theoretical and Cognitive Neuroscience and he's going to tell us about his research interest and his plans for the future for the group, so please. Okay, thank you very much for, for the invitation to the, to the department, to, to Miguel Angel and Vanessa for, for the organization of this, uh, of this uh, seminar. So today I'm going to be talking about uh, whether we can decode uh, the brain. Uh, so this uh, work has been <clears throat> funded by this, uh, by this uh, scheme. So the brain consists of uh, 100 billion uh, neurons embedded in very high dense uh, circuit, uh, like this one. So if we take uh, one single neuron in this circuit, can this neuron hear the rest of the neurons in the circuit, or it can just read out a few cells in the circuit? And what about us, uh, theor uh, theoreticians and experimentalists of, uh, of the brain? Can we listen to one of these cells and determine or know what the circuit is doing, what the other cells are doing? So in order to answer this question, we need to know how information is represented in the brain. So one possibility that I illustrate over here is that every cell in the circuit represents a very complex uh, feature with a very strong overlap and uh, activation of neurons that corresponds to these uh, features represents the perception of a high-level object, such a face. So this is an illustration of what is called the uh, distributed coding uh, idea of the brain. Essentially, information is not in a single neuron, information is, uh, is widespread uh, across uh, many cells in the brain to represent an item such as, uh, such as this face. Another possibility is that uh, every neuron in a particular circuit represents a, a complex uh, object, such as a face, different faces, very special faces. And in this case, activation of a, of a single neuron will suffice to uh, have the representation or the perception of a given uh, face, like, uh, like this one. So this uh, illustrates an alternative uh, code, which is called the sparse uh, coding idea of the brain. So what I think is that the brain is, is even much more complex than the, either of the two. So let's assume that the uh, particular uh, moment of time there is an object in the world that is very important, such as uh, this uh, phase. What I think is going to happen is that all neurons in this circuit are going to be representing in a dynamical fashion this object. So they're going to be, uh, they're not going to be representing different features, but they're going to have information about the relevant object in the world. In this case, uh, this face. So I would like to use uh, an, an analogy. So this is a radio, very old radio. So I think that we can view the behavior of a single cell as a radio antenna that is, uh, emits and broadcasts information to the rest of the brain. And at the same time, you can see or you can view a neuron as, behavi as behaving as a radio receptor. A radio receptor that can, if, appro if, uh, if uh, appropriately tuned, you can listen any channel that is played in the brain. For instance, any neuron here could listen the relevant information in the world, in this case, a face. So if information is widespread in the brain, as uh, we suggest, then we could pretty much take any bunch of cells in any area in the brain and decode the information that those neurons have about the, about the stimulus. So what do we mean by decoding? 
I mean, my colleagues here in the department probably know very well what do I mean by decline because they use this word in, a, in, a, in, in very similar uh, fashion. But for the general audience, so what I mean is the following. Let's assume that we stimulate the, the brain with a stimulus S. Then we record the activity of a few cells in the brain. And now we use a uh, an algorithm, a decoder, like a radio receptor, that uh, inter interprets this information and tell us what was the stimulus that most likely was presented to this, uh, to this uh, person. So what about this other scenario? What do we mean by decoding in this scenario? Let's assume that now there is no stimulus. But we know that the brain undergoes its own internal dynamics. It's, uh, you are thinking, you are feeling. So in this case, we are very interested in trying to decode or predict what you are going to do next, what this person is going to do next. So what we are interested in decoding or predicting are the choices in this case. And these choices, of course, are generated by some internal dynamics of the brain that doesn't fully correspond to the stimulus that has been presented that is experimentally controlled. So I would like to, to illustrate this, uh, this with an example. So this is a set of, uh, of uh, dots moving uh, many of them in random directions. And a fraction of those dots are moving in the same direction. And your task here is to tell whether th these dots are moving to the right or to the left. So in this case, I don't need to be inside your brains to know what you are perceiving. So what you're perceiving is rightwards uh, motion. Okay. But now let's look at this other uh, example. So in this case, we have uh, similar stimulus. But now the dots are moving randomly in any random direction. Okay. And your task is still to tell whether these dots are moving to the right or to the left. In this case, I don't have any way to predict what you are going to be uh, your choice. In this case, I will know to be inside your brain and record for a few cells to predict whether you're going to be telling me that these dots are moving to the right or to the left. So in a, in a classical series of experiments by, uh, by Newson and, and Shadlen, uh, they train monkeys to report the direction of motion in exactly the same stimulus that you have seen before, to answer precisely the question of whether it's, po whether it's possible to go inside your brains and find neurons that predict what's going to be the choice and, uh, for that stimulus. So this is an illustration of, uh, of, uh, of what the monkey has to do uh, to solve a task. So this is the monkey is fixating here. Then two targets appear, one on the right and the other on the left. And then a stimulus, the random dot the stimulus appears in the center. And the animal has to keep fixation over here and has to perceive or try to extract information about whether these dots are moving to the right or to the left. Because actually the task of the monkey is to tell whether these dots are moving to the right or, to, or towards the left. And of course, because we cannot ask directly the monkey to tell us what is uh, uh, its choice, we, or uh, these experimenters, what we do is to ask the monkey to make a, a saccadidite movement from the fixation point towards the right target if the, move, if the dots were moving to the right, or towards the left target if the dots were moving to the, to the left. So of course here, the interesting condition again is the condition that you saw the latest a condition in which the dots are moving randomly in any direction. So we don't have a way to predict what the animal is going to do. And yet, we are going to be listening the activity of, of a few cells in this animal. And maybe I'm hoping that the, by listening the activity of this cell, we can predict what the, uh, the animal is going to do on that particular trial. So I'm going to show you a video, but before the video, I'm going to um, dissect the, the video a little bit so you, you can interpret it uh, correctly. So this is going to be the, the, the target fixation point, but this is the actual uh, position of where the animal is looking at the screen. So this, uh, this is a screen, and the yellow is uh, where the animal is looking at a particular uh, time. Then two targets are going to appear here and here. And uh, the stimulus is going to appear in the center. Okay? And the stimulus on a trial by trial basis is going to be moving either in this direction, uh, bottom, uh, bottom right, or this other direction, top left. Okay? And, uh, and uh, 
as I described, the choice of the animal is going to be based on a saccaded, a very fast eye movement from the fixation point towards the target. In this case, the monkey perceived or said that the direction of motion was this direction, and that's why it chose that target. So, so let's uh, listen now to one cell that has been recorded in this animal while it's performing this task and in a condition in which the stimulus is non-informative. So by looking at the stimulus, we won't know what the animal is going to choose. But let's see if we can predict what the animal is going to choose just by hearing this, uh, this cell. So the activity is high now, activity low, activity high, okay. So what, what you just saw, what you just listened, is the activity of a cell, and whenever the activity of this neuron was high, then it was very predictive as to what, was, what would be the choice of the animal, top, uh, top left. If the activity of this neuron was, uh, was relatively low, it was very predictive that the animal would choose the other target. So this is a very simple scenario where we have, we are, kind of, we are very lucky, we find a cell that by itself, by just listening to it, makes us, allows us to predict what's going to be the choice of, of the animal. But in, in general, the problem is going to be much more complicated. So what are the tools that we use to decode the uh, to decode information in the brain. So with the advent of multi electro recording techniques, we are now in a position to record the activity of hundreds of neurons simultaneously using this kind of arrays. This is a UTA array that is inserted onto the surface uh, of the brain. And as a result, we can visualize the activity of hundreds of neurons simultaneously as a function of time at the millisecond resolution. So this leads us with very complex uh, data that we typically summarize with some uh, statistical uh, descriptors. And for instance, here, one that we typically use is what is called the population vector, which is essentially for each neuron, we count how many spikes there were in a particular time window, and we put this count on a vector, and this is the population uh, response of a population of neurons on a given uh, time. We know that the brain uh, has a lot of variability. So we know that if we introduce a stimulus S into the brain, then we have to characterize the probability distribution of the responses of under, uh, under these stimulations. And uh, from this uh, perspective, now one could go to, for instance, to use uh, Bayesian inference or other machine learning techniques to extract information. And these are actually the techniques that we use to, to, to read out uh, information in the brain by using these uh, mathematical, uh, uh, mathematical frameworks. So of course, uh, I said that this, uh, the problem of decoding is, is very challenging. So what are the challenges that, uh, that we are facing? Well, the first uh, challenge is that, uh, is that uh, there is a spiking variability. The responses are never twice the same. So let me show you an example. So this is a stimulus that is typically used in, uh, in neuroscience. Is a, it will be like a, a grating moving in a particular direction. And now if you recall from a, from a neuron in primary visual cortex, these neurons like this, this uh, stimuli. So if you put this stimuli in the receptive field of that neuron, you're going to have tons of spikes from, uh, from the neuron. So you run experiment, you record one trial from, uh, from one such uh, neurons, and this is what you get. This is a sequence of spikes as a function of time. By the way, this is what you, what you uh, hear before, these uh, this discrete events. You, you hear uh, this, uh, these events, which are called spikes. So what you see, is, again, is a sequence of spikes. So this is, uh, uh, is, uh, this is telling us that this neuron is responding whenever this stimulus is presented, so that's good. But the, the surprise arises when uh, exactly the same experiment is conducted by recording exactly the same neuron and using the same stimulus. And when you repeat the experiment in a second trial, what you get is pretty much a completely different response. So again, the neuron fire, but the way it fire is very different. And each time that you repeat 
this experiment recording from a satellite the same neuron and being stimulated with the same stimulus, you get a unique set of spikes, as you can see here. So this is the first challenge. So we don't have a unique mapping between a stimuli and responses. But this is not the only challenge. There is a second challenge. The second challenge is that this variability that is observed at the single neuron uh, uh, level is observed at the population level. And actually, there is what is called co-variability. So the variability between neurons is correlated. So this is a, a classical description. This is the cross-correlation function, which plots the joint probability density of having two spikes from two cells separated out by some time lag. Uh, above, uh, and here, the presence of a peak uh, centered around uh, time lag zero means that these neurons, these two neurons, tend to like to fire together in time. Okay? So, this is what's going on with, uh, when you have two neurons. But when you have a population of neurons, the, the correlated patterns that can arise are very, very complex, like uh, these bursts of activity uh, around this time, as you can see here. So, this makes the whole thing very complicated. Because, uh, because both variability and correlations are going to make uh, harder and very, very difficult to train the colors and to learn the statistical models that uh, Bull allows us to, to understand what is the code of the brain. So if we want to decode information from the brain, the first question that we have to address is how much information is actually there in the brain? That's the first question. So psychophysical uh, uh, results, uh, 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 which measure the behavior of, uh, of humans, have shown very, very, uh, very often that our performance in the most simple task, such as orientation discrimination, is relatively poor. And actually, we made very conspicuous mistakes sometimes. So this relatively poor performance at low level uh, perception contrast with uh, our capabilities to deal with very complex uh, problems such as mathematics and philosophy. So this means that somehow there is something that is limiting how much information we have about this very simple stimuli. And we don't know yet what limits this, uh, the, our performance when dealing or performing very, very simple perceptual tasks. So there are two possibilities here. One possibility is that uh, there are tons of information in the input in the brain coming from our sensors, uh, but the brain cannot make a good use of this information. It's maybe suboptimal and it loses um, a lot of information. That's one possibility. The other possibility is that actually the brain is very optimal, it's very well tuned, but the sensors are very crappy, they are very bad. So essentially, the actual input information arriving into the brain maybe is very severely limited. So the former possibility is, was excluded by, uh, uh, by this theoretical analysis uh, uh, published uh, recently. And uh, well, here what I have is a neural network that uh, is connected in any arbitrary way. So we have many neurons, uh, n neurons. And here, interestingly, so we're going to uh, study the dynamical properties of these networks and how these networks transmit information and represent information. And here, one very important point was uh, to fix the input information that was coming in into the network. And we did that by fixing a, a signal, adding some shared noise that is going to be shared across all the neurons in the, in the network. And in addition, there's going to be some independent noise. So the important factor here is the presence of shared noise. So this shared noise allows us to control how much information is coming in into the network. Okay? But here the point is that while we are fixing input information, we can change drastically the dynamical properties of this network. For instance, we, catch, we can change the connectivity matrix, the way these neurons connect, in such a way that these networks work in, a, in what is called a synchronous regime, a regime in which the correlations are very weak, neurons become almost independent, or by choosing a different set of parameters, I can make this network to work in a very synchronous regime, a, a, a state in which uh, you're going to have many neurons firing simultaneously in a very correlated uh, way. So 
this is a, a different uh, visualization of the same result. So these are the distributions of, uh, of correlations across uh, three different networks. One network in which uh, the correlation coefficients were very low, and one other network in green in which the correlation coefficients were order 0.1 which uh, amounts to a two fact order of magnitude difference in correlations between these two types of networks. So essentially we can span a huge repertoire of dynamical uh, ranges by changing the parameters of this uh, network. But now the question is whether the, the dynamical regime of this network affects how much information we can read out from the stimulus. That's the, that's the important question. And here you have to remember that the stimulus is fixed. So we know how much information is there. So now we can use the same techniques that we use to read out information in the brain to read out information in this artificial uh, network. And this is uh, what we found. What we found here in plotting the information as a function of the size of the network. And the input information is characterized by this uh, black line over here. Okay? And the dots over here are results from the simulations and the results from our decoders trying to extract information about the stimulus. And what you can see is that regardless of the working regime of this network, asynchronous or synchronous, there is very little dependence of how much information we can read out uh, about the stimulus from this network when the network is very small. But if we consider more realistic the scenarios, where well, actually the networks are large, and in cortex uh, networks are very large, around 500 cells, then, then this holds exactly true. Regardless of the working regime of the, of, the, of the network, we can extract all input information. So it's pretty clear that the brain is very likely not responsible for having poor performance at very low, a very simple perceptual task, because because it's very easy to, to, to transmit and decode all that information. So it's very uh, stupid to think that the brain doesn't know how to do this. So the alternative is that actually there is some uh, finite, uh, some severe uh, limitations in input information. But how can this be possible? So we are uh, taught that, the, that the, our eyes is, a, is an amazing device. But in reality, we, uh, we should acknowledge that it's not such an uh, such amazing device. For instance, it has aberrations, it has tremor, we, can, we need to wear glasses. So actually, our sensors uh, may introduce very strong limitations as to how much information, or actual, as to how much pixel information is there about the image. So the input to start with into the brain is severely corrupted by our sensors. So, so this is the alternative that we have. And if this is the alternative, then we can make very interesting predictions as to what kind of correlations should uh, emerge in neural networks. So this is uh, what we did in this uh, theoretical uh, uh, analysis. And I'm going to describe to you very intuitively what kind of correlations emerge when you have a strong limitations in the input of your network. They're going to be a peculiar type of, uh, of correlations. So, so what I have over here is the, is the population response for a given stimulus. So on average, so each, each dot corresponds to a, uh, to a neuron in this population. So here we have the other 80 cells. And this is uh, on the y-axis what you have is the firing rate, the average firing rate that every neuron will fire under this blue stimulus. We can call it blue stimulus. Okay? There is a blue stimulus, and this is on average what every neuron will fire. Okay, here, of course, you will have some neurons that fire a lot. This will be like the V1 neurons that we saw at the beginning. And there will be some other neurons that they fire very little. Okay? So, so let's make this like a discrimination task. Let's, uh, let's assume that uh, you don't know whether you're going to be uh, exposed to a blue stimulus, to a green stimulus, or to a red stimulus. So these three colors represent the stimuli, and these three uh, set of dots represents the population response on average of a cortical circuit that you are studying and recording from, for instance, okay? So, so let's think a little bit now. So what happens if in the brain there is independent variability across neurons? 
Okay, we know that there is variability. So this is not what you get to see, what the brain gets to see in any single trial. This is something that you will buy, build in on average. On a single trial, you may get something like that. Okay? Let's assume that there is independent variability across cells, and this will be the population uh, activity uh, response on a single trial. Okay? And as you can see, there is variability around some mean. And now if I asked you to, to tell me what was the stimulus that was uh, used, for you it's going to be very easy to tell me that the stimulus was the blue stimulus. Actually, you were right. So what I took is that I took the average responses of, uh, of this blue curve, and I had uh, Poisson noise on top of that, and this is what they got. So you were right. And, but this is telling us that independent noise across neurons actually doesn't harm how much information. So the presence of this variability when you have many neurons, you can average out this uh, variability, and you can tell very well what was the stimulus. It was the blue stimulus in this case. So, but you can tell me, okay, this is very, very a stupid type of, of, of variability and correlations here. Neurons are independent, and you were telling me before that neurons are correlated. Okay, so let's add correlations. Let's add very strong correlations. Let's assume that neurons are highly correlated one each other, and uh, essentially, if you have uh, all of these neurons in this particular trial experience a positive fluctuation above the mean. So this is what the, the, the black curve over here is what you got on a particular trial. Okay? And if I asked you the same question, what was the stimulus that was used? For you, it's going to be very easy to tell, again, that the stimulus that was used was the blue one. Okay, you are just using template matching, and you're going to say, okay, which one is closest? Yeah, the blue one. Okay, so this is an interesting perceptual demonstration of a very important mathematical fact, which is that even very strong correlations in a network don't necessarily limit how much information you have in the network. Even if you have a strong synchrony, maybe that synchrony doesn't limit uh, the information, like in this case. Okay? Okay, but what are the type of correlations that limit information in the brain? Well, let's consider this, uh, this uh, scenario. So here we have, uh, again, I'm going to be using the blue stimulus, and now let's assume that neurons that are on the left side of this, of this, uh, uh, of this uh, hill have a positive fluctuation, and neurons that lie on the right side of this uh, Gaussian-like uh, uh, response have a negative fluctuation in the response. So let's assume that on a particular trial, the response of this population looks something like that. Okay? If the response looks something like that, essentially like a translation of the blue dot set of dots into this uh, 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 black set of dots, now you are dead. If I asked you what was the stimulus that was used, whether the stimulus was the blue stimulus or the green stimulus, you're not going to be able to tell now what was the stimulus that was used. Maybe the stimulus that was used was the green stimulus, and there was a fluctuation that uh, moved this population hill towards the right, as opposed to have uh, a blue stimulus and a fluctuation of activity that moved the population hill towards the left. You won't know that. Well, actually, we have shown that these type of correlations are the only type of correlations that can surely influence information in the brain. I mean, you can have different type of correlations that they want to affect how much information you, you have. So a little bit more formally, but not much. So we can think of, uh, uh, so we can assume that we change the stimulus parameter S, can be any stimulus parameter that you are interested in, uh, in studying. And as a function of this stimulus S, you can plot the average firing rate of your population in activity space. Here I put in two axes, okay, two, two, two activities. So this is going to define a one-dimensional manifold, something that moves you uh, uh, in a parameterized way as a function of S. So the only type of, of, uh, of correlations or fluctuations in the brain that can limit information are those that are going to move you around this line. So essentially, this will be like the, the inf uh, correlations that limit information. It, and if those fluctuations move you along those lines, uh, those, this, uh, this uh, uh, one-dimensional manifold, then you're not going to be able to tell whether there was a fluctuation generated intrinsically by the brain or whether the experimenter changed the stimulus. And that's the reason why these type of correlations are the only ones that limit uh, information. So just a little bit more mathematically, but, uh, but not uh, going much into details. 
we can write down any covariance metrics that describes the correlation patterns, the synchrony patterns across cells uh, in, a, in a particular uh, uh, circuit as having two contributions. The first contribution is going to be a contribution that doesn't affect uh, information. And there's going to be a second contribution that we call differential correlations because this corresponds to the derivatives of this uh, function f onto uh, at a particular point. So we project onto this tangent. And we call these differential correlations. And these are the only type of correlations that can uh, limit information in the brain in a, in a sensory circuit. OK. So, so with this, we have characterized, well, what type of correlations will emerge if you have very, very, uh, very poor inputs into a, into a neural network. But what about this, second, this uh, first term? So is, the, is this first term playing a particular role? And uh, the answer to this uh, question was uh, found uh, partially in this uh, paper that was very, very recently published with uh, Inigo Arandia, a, stu a student in the, in the group. So, so here we, we went back to, to the tradition uh, of, uh, of uh, describing the, the response properties of, of neurons. So this is just for you to, to know that typically uh, you have a, here a neuron that you are recording, then you have a stimulus that is characterized by some parameter, for instance, the orientation. And the experimenter changes the, the, this parameter and uh, plots the fine rate of this neuron as a function of that parameter. And typically, you get a bell-shaped curve, something like that, indicating that this neuron likes particular orientations in, in the world. Okay? Well, this is called the tuning curve. This is called the tuning curve of a, of a cell. And, uh, and with, uh, with Inigo and, uh, and other collaborators, we start to, to think whether this tuning curve actually could be modulated by the activity of other cells uh, in the circuit. So, so this, is the, this was the hypothesis. So in reality, a neuron is not isolated. In reality, a neuron is embedded into a, into a large uh, circuit. And one thing that could happen is that the, the, the response properties of these cells actually depend a lot on what the other cells are doing. For instance, what could happen is that if, uh, if the activity of the population surrounding the, target, the neuron that we are recording from is, uh, is low, maybe what happens is that the tuning curve of this, uh, of this uh, cell over here is modulated negatively. And uh, what could happen also is that, is that if the activity of uh, the surrounding population is, is very high, what could happen is that the, this modulates the tuning curve in this other way, positively. In, rea in reality, there are many possibilities here. And actually, we were open to, to find any, uh, any, any option. So we consider all these possible scenarios. We, we thought that maybe the modulation could be uh, multiplicative, like uh, this one. But uh, why, no, why not uh, uh, additive mo modulation? So essentially, we add up some f uh, activity to all uh, orientations. But could also have uh, more complicated uh, uh, modulations, for instance, the broadening of the tuning curve or displacement of the tuning curve. So we were open to all these possibilities. And to our surprise, the only two type of modulations that we found were uh, multiplicative and additive modul modulation. We didn't find any other type of, of modulation. And here you have a representative set of uh, examples. So here you have an additive cell. So now this is data from a primary visual cortex where, where we plot the response of this cell at, uh, when the population activity was low and when the population activity was high. And there is a very nice additive modulation. And this other cell looks more like a multiplicative, uh, multiplicatively uh, modulated. And the, the, the next interesting result that we found is that actually neurons tend to have one flavor or the other. Meaning that if one neuron tend to have like an additive uh, uh, strong modulation, it tended to have very weak multiplicative effects and vice versa. So here we find kind of like two different subsets of cells, multiplicative and additive cells. Okay, this is the... This is what kids have to learn in the, in, in the school to, to, do, uh, uh, to, to start to learn math, M multiplications and additions. And it looks at primary visual cortex has the tools to implement these two basic operations. And these are the only ones that we see in, uh, in our data. So what this is uh, uh, doing? So, so we look at the, uh, more carefully 
these different uh, these two classes of uh, of cells, multiplicative and addit additive cells, and we found that actually the information that we could read out from these cells depended a lot on uh, on what kind of neuron it was. So, for instance, when we took uh, multiplicative cells, then when population activity went up, the activity the information that we could read out from multiplicative cells went up. And when we took additive cells, when population activity went up, the information that we could read out from these cells went down. So essentially, these two types of cells transmit information in a way that depends on the population activity. So it looks that the, these neurons are transmitting information, are rooting information within, the, within the, the neural circuit in a very interesting way. But what about total information? Is total information uh, uh, a, fun a, a function of uh, population activity? So this is what uh, we are addressing in this, uh, in this uh, figure here. Here we have decoding performance as a function of the size of the ensemble. And to our surprise, we found no dependence on total information on uh, population activity. So population activity doesn't affect how much information you have in the neural circuit. There is some amount of information, and it's always that amount of information. But, but this uh, gives us like a general picture of what's going on. So the circuit surrounding a neuron that you're looking at may be at a at low firing rate, or it might be at a high firing rate. Okay. If, if your circuit has a low population activity, then multiplicative cells have low information while additive cells have uh, large information. But if population activity is high, multiplicative cells have uh, a lot of information, and additive cells have uh, less information. So it looks that population activity acts as a traffic light that controls which neurons are going to have more or less information at every single time. Okay. So. So far, we have described in quite a bit uh, detail uh, how we can read out information from a sensory cortex, how much information do we expect to find in sensory cortex. And we have seen how different aspects of, uh, of uh, population activity modulate this, uh, this information. But what about coming back to one of the questions that I asked at the beginning of the lecture, which is, can we predict the choices something that is generated intrinsically in the network, something that has not been put uh, by the experimenter or co really very well controlled by the experimenter. Well, this is the example that we saw at the beginning of, uh, of the lecture. So this is the, the, the monkey watching uh, this random dot stimulus. It's a very difficult stimulus, but we can find neurons that, uh, that tell us what the monkey is going to do. But this somehow was an easy problem because because this neuron was read out when uh, as this, as this animal was watching at the stimulus. So what about trying to predict animal choices even before the stimulus has been presented? Is that possible? Okay, so, so to address this question, we, uh, we uh, uh, ran into a collaboration with uh, Mavi Sanchez Vives uh, in the EDVAPS here in, in Barcelona, and, uh, and we studied the behavior and the neural activity of, uh, of rats. So in order to maximize, uh, maximize the, the, our chances to, to get information about uh, choices before a stimulus presentation, we studied this uh, setup. So here there is a, a rat that uh, self-initiate the a trial by uh, poking at the central uh, port. Then this triggers a, a tone, and then there is a delay, and finally, there is a second tone. So the actual stimulus in this, uh, in this task is the inter-stimulus inter interval. So essentially, the distance between the two tones. So the two tones are identical. The information is going to be in this ISI. And this ISI came into two flavors. So either the ISI could be short, these uh, intervals, these four possible intervals, or they could be long. They could have all these other possible uh, four values. So this is a, a perceptually ch challenging uh, task for the animal, especially when the animal has to distinguish between uh, long, uh, long and, short, uh, and short intervals. Okay. 
So the task here is, uh, is to actually distinguish between the, between the, the uh, ISIs to tell whether the, the ISIs are long or short. And in this case, if the, if the ISI is perceived as being long, the animal has to, make, uh, has to go to the, to the right uh, uh, socket and, uh, and poke over there to get water reward, if that was uh, correct. And if the stimulus was, uh, was a short one, the animal has to go to the left uh, socket in order to get the uh, water reward. If it does uh, otherwise, it will get a, a timeout penalty. So it's something that the animal wants to avoid. The animal wants to do this task as, as well as possible. So, so this is the, these are the sequence of events that a rat will find on a single trial. But uh, here, we want to maximize our chances of finding choice-related activity even before the stimulus is presented. Okay? In order to do this, what uh, we did in, uh, with, uh, with uh, Sanchez Vives was to introduce some uh, complex uh, correlations across trials, some interesting structure in the environment. So what was this, uh, this structure in the environment? So let's assume that we start with a, with a stimulus, and let's assume that this is a short ISI, and let's assume that the animal make a correct choice, indicated by this uh, green uh, bar, green pl uh, plus. So if this happens, if the response is correct, is correct then the next uh, trial is going to be randomly drawn from a, a uniform distribution across all these uh, possible eight values. So there is no information about what is going to be coming next after a correct response. So let's assume that the next trial corresponds to a long uh, choice, a long uh, interstimulus uh, inter interval. And let's assume that the animal make a, makes an incorrect uh, choice. Okay. Then what is going to happen is that in the next trial, the same stimulus is going to be repeated. And it's, it's going to be repeated until the animal gets it right. Okay? And when the animal get it, gets it uh, right, the next, uh, the next trial is going to be again drawn, uh, uh, drawn randomly from the same uniform distribution across all these possible eight uh, uh, values, and so on and so forth. So this structure is not, very, it's not commonly uh, used. But this in, it introduces a very interesting, uh, uh, interesting correlations that uh, makes the environment a little bit more complex because now the environment is described formally as an outcome coupled hidden Markov chain. And this has some interesting predictions because so we know that after a correct response, we know that the animal doesn't, cannot predict what is going to be coming next. But after an incorrect response, it should be able to predict what is becoming next. So after training across many, many trials, the animal is going to learn that after an incorrect response, the same stimulus is going to be repeated next. And as a result, the animal has to switch the, the socket. Okay, has to go to the other socket. So one interesting prediction here is that the animal should have a behavior, should show a behavior that reflects, that has learned this uh, property of the task. So let's see the behavior of the, of the animal. Um, so here what would you have is this, uh, the psychometric curve. This is the probability of making long choices as a function of the ISI. So what you see here is something very sensible, which is that the probability of making a long choice is larger whenever the ISI is larger. So the animal is understanding the, the, the task. And this is the perceptual, uh, the perceptual, the perceptual part. Okay? This is the, beha the behavior of the animal on average. But what happens when the, when the animal makes a mistake? When the animal makes a mistake, it should know that the next trial is going to be repeated. And it should uh, figure out uh, what is the, the correct response in the next trial. So when we plot the same curve uh, indicating the performance of the animal after incorrect, incorrect responses, what we find is that uh, actually the performance has increased. So this is indicating that the animal actually has learned the structure of the task. And this is uh, so essentially after an incorrect trial, the slope has increased of this curve. So we analyze further this, uh, this behavior by, uh, by um, looking at the strategy that the animal was uh, following on a trial by trial basis. And here, what you have is a set of uh, sessions for all the three rats. What you have in the y axis is the probability of loose switch. So if the animal makes an incorrect uh, choice, it will switch to the other socket. And here on the x-axis, you have the probability of winning state, the probability that you make, if you get it right, you again try the same socket in the next trial. 
So what we see consistently is that there is uh, uh, some positive win uh, probability that the cluster is quite close to 0.5, so pretty much to indifference. In, in, in 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 but what we found what is very strong and very robust is that the probability of loose uh, switch was consistently high for all sessions and for all rats. So essentially, rats use uh, mainly uh, the strategy that consists of uh, switching uh, the choice when it makes it uh, a wrong choice. And this is consistent with, uh, with, uh, with the, uh, the experimental design. Actually, it was designed uh, to, in that way. So, so with Mavi, uh, we want to record the activity in orbital frontal cortex. This is an area in the brain of the rat and uh, in, in other mammals that is very high, high up in the hierarchy. It receives uh, tons of uh, very processed uh, information, but also sensory information. And it has been shown to play a very important role in, in decision making and in some interesting deficits of decision making. But, uh, but uh, interestingly, it has not been shown that uh, convey signals about uh, choices before a stimulus presentation. So it was an interesting target uh, for us uh, to look at. Uh, so what we found here is, uh, and it was quite interesting, which is the first analysis that we, uh, we, uh, we performed in this uh, data set show very, very strong signals about the choices of the animal. So almost without any basic analysis, we could find very strong signals about what the animal is doing. And we found neurons, for instance, that the, whose firing rate is strongly modulated by the, by the choice, uh, uh, le, uh, uh, long or short, uh, at different time periods. But what, we've, what, what, what was uh, much more interesting and surprising was uh, uh, examples of single neurons that when, look at, when we look at them at before a stimulus presentation, we found that before even the animal could uh, uh, possibly see the stimulus, we could predict by, using, by looking at this, uh, at this uh, uh, cell what the animal will be, uh, will be uh, choosing in the next uh, trial. So here you have a, a cell whose uh, activity is strongly modulated by, uh, by the choice which is going to occur much, uh, much uh, later. In addition to finding these uh, signals, we found very other interesting signals about, uh, for instance, information about the past that I'm going to describe uh, in a second. So, so I'm going to show the results of uh, GLM analysis where we try to, uh, to estimate how many neurons had information about the specific aspects of this uh, task. And this task is very complicated, so we uh, introduce uh, many possible uh, regressors. And this is, uh, and uh, to start with, we're going to look at the, what's going on before a stimulus presentation. So what I'm going to be putting here is the fraction of neurons, of single neurons, that were found to have uh, reliable information about many possible regressors. And I'm going to digest uh, this uh, 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 with you. So the main important uh, result was that information about, uh, about uh, events that happened two or three trials back were no, was not in code in uh, orbital frontal cortex. So this is interesting because this information that happens very, very, uh, very, uh, very late, very early uh, across, across trials, doesn't uh, play any role in the, in, in the behavior of the animal. And so what we found is information about uh, what the animal is going, to do, is going to do. So before a stimulus presentation, we, we found a, a large fraction of cells that predicted what the animal is going to do next. And we also found information about uh, what I should do variable. So, so this is a variable that, uh, that uh, takes into account whether it was a mistake, whether there was a mistake in the previous trial or, or not. And if there is a mistake, there is a variable that should tell the animal switch the socket because you make a uh, wrong response and the next trial is going to be the same. It's going to be the same, uh, the same as stimulus, so you have to, sh to switch. So there was information about this, about this uh, variable and there was also information about what I'm going to do, about what the animal is, is going to do. Okay? So we went to a different uh, period of time in which uh, already the stimulus was uh, presented. So this is after the stimulus uh, presentation. And we repeated the same analysis, and we found, again, strong signals 
about uh, what the animal is going to do. Actually, the animal is still not doing anything because uh, it just finished uh, uh, listening to the stimulus. So this is a still predicted uh, uh, behavior. We're predicting what the animal is going to do. And uh, here, not very surprisingly, but it was a very nice uh, check, uh, we found that there was tons of information about the stimulus. <laughs> Many neurons in this area encode information about the stimulus in this uh, time period. And then we went to the, to the final uh, epoch of time, which is uh, the actual movement. And here, what we found, it's a very interesting observation, is that pretty much all neurons that we uh, record in the frontal cortex have an activity that correlated with the choice of the animal. So essentially, the whole network represents the actual choice of the animal, which was a very, very surprising to find to, uh, for us to find uh, such as uh, so many neurons uh, encoding the, the choice. And uh, so here, this is just a summary of, uh, uh, of all the, these results. So essentially, I'm plotting here the fraction of neurons for these uh, three uh, epochs of time that uh, I described. And let me just uh, highlight uh, two of these uh, lines. So the first one is uh, what I'm going to do variable. So how many neurons tell you what the rat is going to do? And uh, we found like a, like a very sharp uh, rise of, this, uh, of the encoding of this uh, variable, as you can see here. And very interestingly, of course, there was very strong and significant encoding of this variable even before presentation of the stimulus. Okay. So it looks that this, new, this, uh, this circuit is playing a very important role in generating the choices, or at least representing the generation of the, of the choices. And the second line that I would like to, to highlight is the uh, stimulus information. So stimulus information was barely significant in, uh, initially, then ran up during a stimulus uh, offset. So this is very sensible. And when these two pieces of information, information about the past, and information about the current stimulus mixed together here, the stimulus information goes down. So this uh, whole set of results uh, suggests the following picture. It suggests that the uh, orbitofrontal cortex activity is consistent with a role in integrating past uh, with uh, current information and uh, in the formation of choices, because essentially we, uh, we have been able to, uh, to detect the presence of very strong signals about, uh, about choices. So let me summarize. So we have described, sorry, we have described the type of uh, correlations that limit information in the brain. We, uh, we think that these type of correlations uh, are going to be there in the brain. Nobody has uh, still uh, detected these type of correlations. They, are very, uh, they can be very tiny. And, uh, but this will be there if, uh, uh, if, uh, if we are right and uh, information in our sensors is strongly limited. I've uh, described to you that uh, uh, other type of correlations that they don't have any anything to do with the stimulus encoding, they may play a very important role in uh, controlling how uh, information is rooted into the neural circuit. Okay, and we have seen that uh, that the population activity controls not only the tuning curve of the cells, but also which type of cells have more information at any given time. And finally. We have found very strong signals about, uh, about, uh, what, about uh, choices of, of an animal before a stimulus uh, presentation. So the fact that we can find so many uh, neurons encoding choices in this task, the, fa the fact that we can even predict what the animal is going to do before a stimulus presentation suggests that a view like this uh, may be uh, correct in which Essentially, all task relevant uh, 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 information is widespread and broadcasted throughout the brain. And uh, essentially, every neuron will have access to the relevant uh, information. And so I would like to acknowledge uh, the people who have been doing this, uh, this uh, work. Inigo is responsible for the work on, the, on population uh, uh, dependent tuning curves. Ramon is the one responsible for the, for the last piece of, uh, of uh, rat uh, behavior and the neural uh, data. The first part was made in collaboration with Alex Puget and, uh, and uh, other people, not uh, quite here. And here, um, <clears throat> I didn't have to time to talk about the, the very interesting work that other student is doing in, in, the, in the lab, Philip uh, Sustek on decision making, and the very interesting uh, work that uh, Gabriela Moschol started to 
to, to perform, to try to understand the neuroeconomic basis of uh, choices in monkeys. So with this, uh, I'm done. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this uh, very interesting talk. So I wonder whether, well, uh, as far as I understood, so you're focused on decoding more or less uh, visual stimuli, no? So visual information. Yes. So uh, did you work, did you look at, let's say, more complex audio stimuli, so the language? And do you think that there is a difference between the two, the visual and the, 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 the audio, or language more specifically? Yeah, in, in our lab, we don't work on, the, on, those, uh, on that line of uh, research, but this is very, very interesting. And uh, I mean, the, the semantic representation of information about language is really very, very complex. And, I, and uh, in contrast to, to, to what we know about, uh, for instance, primary, primary visual cortex, we know tons of things. We know how uh, the basic features are encoded in primary visual cortex. We know relatively less about uh, how information is encoded in, uh, in, in uh, in high-level auditory uh, cortex. So, but in principle, the, the main tools uh, can be used I mean, uh, for, uh, to decode uh, information relevant for any particular task. And actually, there is a, a nature paper by, uh, by, uh, uh, where uh, Tony uh, Griffiths is one of the authors, where they use this type of uh, techniques to, uh, to create these semantic maps that, uh, that tell us uh, how this information is represented throughout the brain. Yes, thank you for the talk. Uh, I have a, a conceptual question uh, about uh, the first part of the talk. Uh, the fact that uh, so the information that comes from the sensors uh, is noisy and that uh, some little shift in cell activity can lead to an indetermination in the effective uh, stimuli, would it be related to the development of the interpretative uh, capacity of, uh, of the human brain? Well, if I understood you correctly, so the point is why we have these very poor uh, receptors? No. Uh, okay, sorry. <laughs> no problem. Uh, no, the question is um, whether uh, the, inter the, the, the strong interpretative ca capacity of the human brain is somehow related with uh, the poor performance of the sensors. Well, the, the point is that it's not. I think that, that yeah. So, so my, my feeling is that, the, is that the complexity of the brain is uh, most likely allocated not to process uh, <clears throat> uh, in very, very detailed sensory stimuli, but in doing very complex uh, tasks. So the fact that we have very poor receptors, in, uh, in relatively, I mean, if you compare the, the optics of the eye with the optics of your camera and your cell phone, uh, the, your cell phone is much better in trying to uh, in, in getting inf uh, pixel information. Our eyes are very bad in that. But uh, maybe there was not a limiting factor in evolution because uh, we can see relatively very well. And now the evolution went in a different direction. Evolution went in a direction in which the size of the brain grew up just to make more complex computations based on this uh, limited sensory information. I mean, it's okay to have uh, sensory limited information. What uh, is not okay is to, to not make uh, good use of that information. And, uh, and, uh, and essentially, I think that all these high level uh, uh, cognitive capabilities are coming uh, not despite uh, 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 sensory information because it's not the main role of the big chunk of, of, of the brain. So there are also other ways to try to record the firing neurons, for instance, like calcium imaging. So where you also actually try to uh, record the signals from single cells firing and record the behavior, analyze that. Mm -hmm. So uh, I do not know whether those are more accurate than the receptors. 
and how do you see whether your methods or your tools are able to uh, apply to those signals for analysis later on? Mm -hmm. Uh, I mean, the, the tools are general, a general purpose uh, tools. So they can apply, actually they have, they are right now being applied to, to all sorts of uh, data sets, uh, fMRI, EEG, uh, calcium uh, imaging. But if you're asking me about uh, what are the benefits of calcium imaging versus uh, spike uh, activity, that is the main focus of, uh, of, our, of our lab, I will tell you that uh, so calcium imaging so far, it doesn't have uh, that great uh, temporal resolution. So uh, the temporal resolution is, uh, is around uh, tens of milliseconds, if, if not uh, worse. While the signals that you can record using uh, uh, um, um, electrophysiology are going down be even be, uh, below one millisecond. So the temporal precision of the signals that you can record is much higher with, uh, with electrophysiology so far. And, uh, and this can be this, this actually can be important in some uh, in some for some problems. For instance, uh, in very fast behaviors or like uh, animals that move very fast, having this very uh, very fine uh, uh, temporal precision is very important because if you don't have this, if you don't have it, then you can lose quite a lot of uh, uh, computation that is going on in between. So, for instance, fMRI would be the poorest uh, example in that uh, direction. Oh, the time scale is uh, half a second. Uh, so it's very difficult with this signal to, uh, really to target uh, um, the processes that describe, for instance, decision making. Decision making is very fast. So, so you just have, you, have, you are presented with two options. Uh, it can be as fast as uh, less than uh, 500 milliseconds. So you process all the information uh, right away, you integrate the information, and then you make a choice. All that three things in half a second. So all these processes, all these soft processes are important per se, and, and we don't know how they are represented in the brain. So that's why I think it's very important to go uh, to very high temporal resolution. So, but the tech, all the techniques are being pushed in that direction. Even fMRI will evolve in a direction where uh, temporal resolution will increase, and calcium imaging is almost guaranteed to, to, to get uh, to have very high temporal resolution soon. Thank you very much. It was a very interesting talk. I, I have a question more looking, let's say, um, beyond the, the understanding of how the brain is, is functioning and trying to decode the activity. Um, so if you, if you are focusing on some particular uh, potential implications of this research for like neurodegenerative diseases or for, I don't know, enhancing brain performance or or some applications? Yeah, that's a very good question. In our lab, we don't uh, target that, uh, that very, very interesting uh, topic. Although uh, our final goal is pretty much uh, that. I mean, uh, we want to understand what is the neural code and being able to develop these tools in such a way that people finally will benefit from these uh, uh, tools. Uh, I mean, there are very, very strong groups that, that they apply very similar uh, techniques to uh, to move uh, robotic arms with, uh, with, uh, with the brain, with the motor cortex, or to move a cursor on the, on the screen. And, uh, and so far, we don't have a, a very good understanding of what is the code. In particular, for motor code, uh, the, 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 the codes for, for motor commands is very, very tricky. It's much more complicated because uh, there is an involvement of both uh, the complexity of, uh, of, the, of the neural signals and also the encoding of properties as a function of time. So everything is very dynamic. And, uh, and so far, the tools that we have, they're not really uh, nailing down that problem, but not even the, the best uh, labs in the world. So actually, the, what these labs can do is to, to be able to move the cursor, but you know, it's like if you're, your daughter will be, uh, of three years old, will be moving the cursor, like a very, very jaggy. And uh, so this is the, the state of the art uh, right now. But it's going to be uh, improved, yeah. OK, thanks very much. Then I, I would like to thank you for the great presentation. And it closes the, the seminar today. Thank you.